Hello, and on behalf of Grant Thornton, a warm welcome to this webinar on the spring budget on Q1 and what's next. Thank you very much for joining us today. Now, earlier on, the Chancellor announced his spring budget. And in a moment, the panel will share their initial reactions and thoughts to that. We'll then move on to a discussion on Q1, reflecting on the last quarter, and what to expect for the rest of the year, including the panel's view on the economic climate, doing business internationally, and also the importance of investing in ESG. We'll also have some time for some Q&A towards the end of the programme, so please do start sending your questions and comments in at any time throughout the broadcast, and you can do that via Slido. Now, details should be on the screen. The all-important login details is a hashtag which is already put in for you, and then you need Q1 2023. So please do start sending your questions in now. So let's meet our panellists, and I'd like to welcome Karen, Shellian, Dave, who's in the studio with me, and joining us remotely is Robert. And I'm going to get each speaker to introduce themselves briefly to you. Karen, if I can start with you, a warm welcome to the programme. Hey, good afternoon, Nadine. Uh, so I'm Karen Campbell-Williams. I am UK Head of Tax, so I lead our tax business um, across the UK. And I also have another day job, which is that I do still have a client portfolio. So I look after a portfolio of clients, um, mainly privately uh, owned private equity type back businesses. And we've had a busy afternoon, haven't we, we've watching had a the very budget? Busy afternoon, Indeed. Yeah. Good to have you here. Uh, Shellian, same to you. Hi, I'm Shellian Horn, partner in our economic consulting team. And I advise public sector, corporates and their legal advisors on competition, regulation and public policy. And again, a busy afternoon to Indeed. you as well, not only listening to the spring budget, but following everything that the OBR has been Indeed, saying too. To yes, yeah. indeed. So I look forward to getting your comments. And Dave, a warm welcome to you too. Thank you very much. I'm Dave Dunkley. I'm the CEO of Grant Thornton here in the UK. And I can't say how relieved I am to be sat next to our head of tax on budget day, because that's clearly where a lot of the questions are going to go, but that's me. Indeed. And I know just want to admit this, but it's 25 years in the business, so... You said, oh, yes. Yeah, but congratulations. <laughs> Thank you <Dave>. very much. <laughs> I think someone who's been in the business even longer, very experienced user, Jeremy Hunt's terminology. Welcome to you, Robert. Can you hear us, Robert? I mean, you may be having some technical gremlins at the moment. So over to you, Robert. Oh, we'll come back to Robert in just Sorry, a moment. I can't hear. Okay, there you go. It just shows, shows it's live. We love live broadcasting. <laughs> okay, well, let's get um, the panel's initial reaction to the budget. And interestingly, many of you are aware of Grant Thornton's Business Outlook Tracker, which is a bi monthly survey of 600 mid market leaders. And the latest one was done in February. And Karen, interestingly, 77% of the UK mid market businesses you surveyed were confident that the government would produce a good spring budget. Was it a good spring budget? Well, I suppose that all depends how you look at it, doesn't it? But I guess what would I say? The Chancellor had a clear plan which he, uh, he laid out, and he framed it as a budget for growth. Um, I think you could also say it was a budget for business. There were a lot of business measures in there. Um, and it, if we look at the, you referenced the, uh, out, the business outlook tracker, what's really interesting in that, three of the top things that um, the people surveyed said that they wanted from the budget were certainty around tax, something around levelling up, seeing that levelling up agenda happening, and measures around skills attraction. And we saw measures that addressed all three of those, um, maybe not as much as people would like, um, and there's got to be a bit of balance and all that, but there were measures and all of that. So I think on balance, people would probably say that there were definitely positive measures um, in that budget and there was something for almost uh, you know everyone to take, most businesses to take from it. And interestingly, Jeremy Hunt referred back to that um, Bloomberg speech, which was done in he January, did. those four pillars. Yeah, and if you look at those, he talked about those measures, he talked about employment, he talked about education, he talked about enterprise and he talked about everywhere. Um, the everywhere bit always resonates with me, being from um, the north and various parts of the north at different times in my life. But um, actually, we did see measures that um, addressed all of those areas and sort of that's the underpin for his growth plan, isn't it, across those four E's, if you like. Um, so I guess what would I say? 
We didn't see any movement whatsoever. Um, we had that whole hokey-cokey, didn't we? The corporation tax rate, it's going to be 25%. I think I called it hokey-cokey last time, <laughs> but it was a bit like a hokey-cokey, 25%. Oh, no, it's not. Yes, it is. That stayed, no change on that. We didn't expect that to move, and that stayed at 25% rate, which will apply from 1st of April. Um, but what we have seen announced today were some targeted, quite specific and some targeted business reliefs to encourage investment across capital allowances and R&D, and obviously some measures then around employment. So we'll maybe pick up on some of those, I think. Yeah, so. I think let's start with capital allowances, because I think that would be of great use to the audience watching. OK. So what did you notice there? So, well, two things. I'd probably start by saying, um, although it wasn't specifically announced today, um, it was announced in the last budget, we've got the annual investment allowance permanently in at £1 million. That helps lots of businesses. Um, and, and it was announced as being permanent, so addresses that sort of certainty point we were talking about that sort of planning to invest. Um, what we um, also saw today, um, and this was trailed and sort of, um, so we, we kind of knew this might be coming, but what he did say um, is that there's 100% uh, a full expensing capital for qualifying capital expenditure. So that's 100% for main pool, 50% for special rate pool. That will apply um, from 1st of April. And what we will see, therefore, is that, bit, that ability, and it's going to apply for at least three years. Um, so we've got that certainty uh, to allow businesses to think about investing. Now, what's really interesting from our point of view on that, a couple of things, I think. Um, the point about certainty I've talked about, but also in terms of um, the Outlook Tracker and some of those surveys and other things that are out there, there were a number of areas where people were saying, um, really um, what difference does that does these tax allowances make towards investment? Well, of the people that we surveyed, 67% uh, of those surveyed had actually claimed the um, yep. super deduction, so that's quite a high percentage, two thirds. But also 79% of them had said it had encouraged them to invest more than they might otherwise have done. So you can actually see that positive encouragement in the budget statement. It said um, uh, that, that it would encourage, it would give 3% growth in investment. So I think that's a really positive move towards that investment. It applies to um, incorporated businesses that pay corporation tax. So importantly, that won't apply to unincorporated businesses, things like large partnerships, which will still have to continue that reliance on the annual investment allowance, that million pounds, if you like. So and just on that certainty point, that's for three years. It's three years. The Chancellor yeah. wanted to go further, but could guarantee three years, which is better than the current two years. So yeah. again, from that Business Outlook tracker, there was an indication that 20% of the people who had responded to the survey had already started dropping off That's on right. investment. Yeah. So that may encourage people back in, knowing they've yeah. got that three yeah, years. Yeah, because they've got that certainty now. Yeah. They were starting to falter because they could see the end of the super deduction coming and therefore that's going to encourage the investment. The other bit that's interesting is that um, the Labour Party last week um, get, announced their business review and one of the things that, or the comments that was made by Rachel Reeves around that was that if the capital allowances measures that were introduced um, by the current government were affordable and were sensible, they would continue um, to back those if there were to be a change in government. So again, who knows? We've not had any. I've not seen any reaction. Certainly in the time that we've had before, we're jumping on this um, panel now, um, so we've not seen that yet. But you would hope that, that that will give a longer degree of certainty, even if there happens to be a change of government in the meantime. So, yes, indeed. Yeah. So capital allowances that was quite a big headline as well. Yeah. And then R and D as well of great interest too. R and D, yeah. So there were there've been in the last two budgets before this one, there were a lot of announcements about R&D. There's lots of changes that are coming in from 1st of April. So just to remind people, we've got the extensions, which are really positive from 1st of April to uncover um, data licenses and cloud costs. So those are coming in. And pure mathematics was another area. So that's a really positive um, and bringing some of that R&D into the modern world, if you like, around some of that. Um, there are some additional compliance measures that are coming in, and I'll come back to one of those in a moment, but that's around things like notifying that you're going to make a claim in advance um, and also the additional information that people are going to have to um, supply so those are coming in and then finally the bit that the was sort of give and take if you like was the reduction in the SME rate which came down from 100% to 86% but then the RDEC the, the research and development expenditure credit is increasing from 1st of April from 13% to 20% so bringing those two closer together and there's still more detail to come on that there's still more to come so there, there's also consultation um, which was announced at the last at the autumn statement around um, bringing the two current schemes, so the RDEC and the SME R&D reliefs, into one 
single scheme. But the consultation on that only closed um, on Monday this week. So as expected, we didn't hear any more on that today. But watch that space. But two things that were actually um, that, um, in the detail, once you get into the detail of some of this, that are quite interesting. One, um, which is positive, is that there was an announcement there will be a restriction on overseas expenditure, being able to claim R&D tax relief uh, on overseas expenditure. That's still going to come in, but instead of that coming in from 1st of April, that's been deferred 12 months and it'll come in from 1st of April 2024, which is good news in terms of just giving businesses a bit more time to plan around that. Um, and then the other area um, there was a change on today that was uh, sort of buried in the detail um, is around um, one of the compliance measures is around um, additional and an additional information form so this is all part of the sort of backdrop of, um, you know, this concern around there being fraud around some of the, you know, fraudulent yeah. claims, etc. So companies are going to have to um, submit an additional information form. That was going to be for accounting periods starting um, after, uh, from 1 April 23 onwards. They've actually brought that forward in the budget today. So that will apply for any claims that are submitted um, after 1st of August 2023. So that could bring forward substantially um, the date that that information has to be supplied. And it will also mean that that might make some claims a bit more restricted because of the timescales. So for example, if you had a business that's the 31st of August 21 um, uh, year end, then that there's a two year window. So they could make a claim by 31st of August 23 but they're going to have to then, um, there's, there's a much shorter time scale, so that's going to stop late claims a little bit or start to clamp down on some of those later claims. So some interesting detail in there that people need to be aware of, I think, as they start to look at their R&D claims. Yeah, that's a really good point, isn't it? And that's where, you know, following up on those conversations are really important because the devil's in the detail. Yeah, absolutely. And interestingly, around employment and even education, we got a sort of sense of where the Chancellor was going in advance. Uh, a lot of um, the media had already broadcast yeah. A few I've areas. just got one other thing on oh, R&D. Have you something else have you on R&D? Go, if go for right, it. Just so yeah. I don't forget. Yeah. So the other area that um, there was an R&D today was around... Um, they made an announcement about the R&D intensive industries. So I talked about the um, SME, and this is for SMEs. So the SME claim was reduced, the, the rate was is reducing from 1st of April. So there was a glimmer of hope in terms of that announcement today about R&D inten intensive businesses and a bit about maybe filling the gap that was being left. Again, in the detail, it's quite interesting because the headline was £27, um, £27 for every £100 of R&D expenditure. Um, but it will apply um, to businesses who have more than 40% of their expenditure, and that's across not just groups, but also um, connected companies and associated companies, they have to spend more, the four, more than 40% of the expenditure has to be on relevant qualifying R&D. But more importantly, the bit that wasn't mentioned in the statement is that that will apply to loss-making companies only. So it will be quite interesting. It'll be valuable for um, startups, for example, in certain situations, and where, but as they start to incur more overhead expenditure um, or start to become profitable, they won't benefit from that. So, what sounded like a really uh, exciting headline um, when you get into the detail is probably quite. It's not. It's not to say it's not valuable. It'll be quite focused in terms of where it'll apply and what yeah. it'll mean. So, can I move on now? You, you can. Brilliant. You can. Fantastic. Yeah, um, I, I sort of. <laughs> teased up the idea of employment and education and there were many rumours around some of the announcements and um, there was quite a big surprise when it came to pensions in there particular, was, yeah. which I know we're going to pick up on now. So yes, employment and pensions, what caught your eye? Well, um, so if we just talk more, before we get on to the pensions, but just um, but still on the supply, the labour supply side, there were the announcement around yeah. childcare, which is quite interesting. Um, so we talked about the free hours, that's going to be phased in, so it's not coming in immediately. So you talked about how that will be phased in to 2025, September 2025, um, and that wraparound care. And the I mean, reality is because the suppliers need to get ready. They do, yeah. To get, go to market with that. But, but it's interesting as well about whether the funding is going to be sufficient. I mean, I've got um, quite a lot of contacts and clients that I know that are childcare providers in this industry. And I think what's going to be quite interesting is just how does... Will the funding be enough? You know, there's an increased funding. I think he said it was increasing by 30%. Is that funding going to be enough to really, um, you know, allow those childcare providers? They make a loss a lot of the time on the actual free childcare hours at the moment. Um, so how will that how will that work in practical terms? And there's also a really big issue in that industry about just having uh, the talent and attracting the talent, and therefore. Um, 
whilst that's great in theory and it's all got to be welcomed and it's got to be good news because anything that then helps to open up that labour market and get more people back into employment is great. How it will pan out practically, I think, is going to be quite interesting. Yeah, the funding so. issue is is a, is a difficult one, isn't it? I know the Institute of Fiscal Studies have been quite critical on the announcement as well. Yeah. So again, it's a it's a great idea, but whether it can be adopted in practice is yeah. a, is how, another how thing. How it will work practically, yeah. I think, is probably the key question. And then the rabbit out of the hat, as you say, there's always a rabbit, isn't there? Yeah. So that was the rabbit. So the rabbit was we we already um, had had um, sort of rumours, hadn't we, about the um, lifetime allowance um, being maybe taken back up to 1.8 million. I, I was smiling when he was talking about experience because I am definitely in the experienced <laughs> camp. Um, so I guess, and I can remember when there was no limit before, back in 2006, and all of that covered in because I've been around for such a long time. But I think what, what was quite interesting on that is the fact that it's sort of... Um, you know, it, it went completely. I think people were thinking, oh, it might be 1.8 million again. They might take it back up from, it was just oh, 1.07 million up to 1.8, but but basically it's uncapped now, so they abolished the cap again. That's amazing, because obviously counterintuitive to earn money with this cap in place. Yeah. So that is going to help a significant amount of people, It'll do you help. think or not? It will help high earners. It will help people in, for example, the, the doctors we talked about, yeah. weren't they? Um, people in um, defined benefit schemes where the value could be quite substantial. Um, and that will hopefully help people. Uh, the desired effect is to stop people retiring early, obviously, isn't it? So hopefully it will have that impact. The, bit, the other bit that was interesting, I think, um, is um, for employers that we should pick up on that I just wanted to flag up from that, is the fact that um, there are quite a few uh, high earners who will not be in, caught within the auto-enrolment um, net at the moment. They may have gone for a cash alternative to pensions because they couldn't make contributions because they were limited around that contributions. Um, and, and also in terms of how the auto-enrolment will work, urgently, because this comes in from 1st of April, Urgently, those employers need to really have a good look at their auto enrolment for their higher earners and make sure that they're addressing that. So, um, and that's something that we can help with, obviously. A bit <laughs> of a plug for Grant Thornton there, but that's something that the employers should be looking at um, very quickly. And also, again, I would also say it's a great opportunity to look at salary sacrifice. That benefits employers, it benefits the employees as well. So it's a win win. So people should be looking at that again as well. Um, the other announcement on pensions that was interesting was around that um, annual allowance in terms of the amount that people can contribute. And it went from forty thousand to sixty thousand, so quite fifty percent increase. Fifty percent increase. What is interesting and might be interesting, to someone, and you might say, "We'll get the violins out," you know, like. Um, <laughs> but for the really higher higher earners, so anyone um, earning above two hundred and sixty thousand is still a taper. So the taper used to kick in at two hundred and forty thousand, and that meant that your highest earners, once you uh, you know got to the top levels, they could only contribute four thousand pounds because it tapers away. For every two pound of income, it tapers away at a pound. What well, that taper will still be in place. So actually, for your very high, anyone who earns three hundred and sixty thousand or more, and again, get the violins out, I know. But if you've got people at that level, they will not be able to contribute the sixty thousand. The, their maximum contribution once you get to that top level will be ten thousand pounds. So it's 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 still a, a great um, sort of announcement. It's still a great incentive. So it's gone up by six thousand for them for the very highest earners. Yeah. Obviously, people, but then people um, in that that sort of band between two hundred and sixty thousand and three hundred and sixty thousand, that will be tapering away. Got it. Um, so very briefly, investment zones and uh, the Chancellor didn't say a huge amount about this, apart from indicating there's going to be twelve investment yeah, zones, which sounded almost like lots of parts of the country when he started listing yes. it all out, yeah. didn't he? So, so we'll nine in else. England and yeah. three in the devolved nations. Yes. So anything on that that would be interesting? I think it's just really hard to say much at the moment around that, other than you hope that you know um, Robert might want to pick up on some of that it might help it'll stimulate you know inward investment it will also stimulate sort of investment in those areas and it's all part of that leveling up agenda as well isn't it in terms yes. of getting investment in the right places there's not really been any detail on what those sort of say for example the tax reliefs that impacts of that might be we'll have to wait and see um how that comes through but um positive news again around leveling up i guess yeah. and just very quickly on pillar two again i don't think the chancellor mentioned anything but it's something that we've covered before in our previous webinars. Yeah, and really important, um, Pillar 2, um, the legislation on that will come into play. It will be in the uh, Spring Finance Bill, which is expected to be out um, next week. Um, so no change on that. Pillar 2 we'll see coming in. Again, for businesses that applies to, so that's um, groups with um, turn, you know, turnover over 750 million euros. If you've not started planning yet, you need to start planning. If you remember, Dan is our man, Dan the man on uh, Pillar 2. If people have um, sort of dialed into the uh, previous webinars, 
get focused on that. And again, we're happy to talk to people about that, but it's an area if you are within those rules and you've not done anything yet, you need to get your skates on. Great, thank you, Karen. Very comprehensive overview of the budget that was announced just uh, you know, a couple of hours ago. And let's get some quick reactions from uh, the rest of the panel just on the budget before we move on looking at Q1 reflections and international investment and ESG. So, Shellyan, what were your thoughts on the budget from an economic point of view? I guess the government was trying to make sure the market steadied, particularly after sort of the Silicon Valley and your know, signature bank crash. And I think it sort of did steady. Um, I think the OBR was obviously behind the government. I think when you read the OBR statement, it's maybe slightly less positive than the government has put out there. And I think some of the commentary that's come back, for example, the Institute of Fiscal Studies and others that you mentioned, I think there is room for probably to um, go into more detail on some of what this means. So Karen was talking about, for example, childcare providers. And I think a number of providers have come out and said, not really going to work for us. We're not really going to provide those extra hours. So I think so we need a little bit more detail. Quite positive, but the OBR were there really providing the context and also the practicality. Yeah. This is going to take time to have an impact. Yeah, and I think you know, they, they were broadly positive. I think they just you know, added a little bit more detail. So whereas we had you know, measures to deal with economic inactivity, you know, OBR was very clear that these things take time. We're looking at sort of a couple of years out and you know, we're going to have some contraction in the meantime. So. Yeah. Dave, how about you? What was your thoughts? Before that, I'd just echo your comment that for Karen to speak like that about a budget, so detailed a budget a matter of hours ago, just I'm in awe and gladly for my colleagues to be relieved I'm not going to say anything detailed about the budget. <laughs> Karen's done that. But I guess you, you stand where we, how you feel now compared to how we felt at the minute but budget, we felt like we've come a long way and thank goodness we have. It does give you some confidence. I know there's some detail to come into. But as an employer, with one of our one of our limiters to growth is access to resource. So I would love to see more of the detail, and we've got to do our bit to get there. But the the, the broader scale uh, measures to about care at one end and over fifties at one end. That's something we should really tap into and look at. Because if we can unlock productivity there, then let's mm -hmm. go for it. But yeah. I think as employers, we have to do our bit. But stand back. It feels a bit better than, well, a lot better than we were in October. So. Yes, a, a bit more sort of stable Absolutely, and certain. Yeah. yeah. Now, Robert, I'm, I'm saying, Robert, your <laughs> thoughts, please. Hoping that you, he's nodding, so hopefully you can hear me. And that um, we've, we've put you back in, we've connected you back in via satellite. So how are you doing, Robert? So firstly, quickly introduce yourself and then give, give us your initial reactions to the budget. Sure. Uh, Robert Hanna, I lead the large corporate and government advisory part of Grant Thornton's business and I also look after all international aspects of our business. So whether that's supporting our clients going internationally or working with our international network to ensure that we deliver for our clients globally. Um, yeah, having the connection back up to Glasgow is something I'd like the government to invest in so that we don't have a breakdown in communications. But uh, uh, from, I guess, an international perspective, the investment zones was the area we were hoping to hear a bit more about. Um, obviously, the focus has been how do they attract more uh, direct investment into the UK? Um, also, you know, where might they be? As you see, up to 12 zones have been confirmed. I think there's about 80 million of funding uh, of a funding envelope in each zone with a range of tax incentives and grant funding expected. And one point I think that did come out is they're going to be based around research institutions such as universities. So they're still focusing on government growth industries, technology, creative industries, but we still don't have all the detail. But that's going to be pretty critical, I think, to help our clients understand how can they access those, as well as obviously attracting business to the UK. Great, thank you, Robert. Yes, indeed, it's working with those universities and local authorities. It felt that partnership, and then there's devil in the detail again, isn't there? We'll probably be finding out more about the investment zones. But uh, thank you for that, we'll come back to you in just a bit. So that concludes our first section on the spring budget. So we're going to move now and look at the economy and how it's done in the first few months of this year, quarter one, as we refer to it. And Shillian, last time we spoke, um, we discussed economic instability at great length and the need yeah. for businesses, rightly so, for increased certainty. Do we have that now? Yeah, I think we're getting there, aren't we? I think last time the government was struggling to take back control. You had the Bank of England not knowing what they were up to. Businesses, I think, totally confused. Um, and this time around, I think we do have that certainty. You know, the, the OBRs come out at least in support of the government's predictions. Um, we're looking at a far shallower downturn. We can't actually use the word recession anymore. We are looking at a sort of negative growth this year, but obviously not technically a recession. Um, inflation down to 3% by the end of the year. I don't think we thought we'd be saying that. Um, and, you know, interest rates may well have peaked. 
or if not, maybe sort of like 4.25 percent. So, you know, I think you know markets and businesses should feel should feel a little bit more certain. I guess you know as as we were preparing for this last week, we all thought everything was going to look great, and then we have obviously had you know, Silicon Valley Bank and um, Signature Bank. And obviously, you know, governments reacted quite quickly, allowed, allowed the purchase of HSBC to go through. And we saw, I think, even quicker and probably sharper reactions from the US. But obviously, the, you know, the market has, has reacted to that. Um, and I guess the government will be aware of that and wanting to sort of, you know, ensure that, you know, we, we have that stability. So I think... And interestingly mm. on that, actually, next week we've got the US, haven't we? Indeed, Announcing indeed. an interest rate rise or not, maybe. Or not, maybe, be. now, exactly. And I think that's why, you know, a moment ago I said, you know, are we looking at... I think, you know, last week we were probably looking at a peak of 4.5% on interest rates. I think the OBR's come out and said maybe 4.25%. I think some people are saying, actually, you might see it sort of stable at 4% for a little while yet as we sort of come to grips with what's happening with Silicon Valley. Yeah, indeed. Mm. And we, we're probably not expecting a rate rise in the immediate future mm. because of how we've seen the banks indeed, reacting indeed, to high indeed. interest rates and the impact they had on their liquidity. So that banking yeah. crisis that we saw this week, we hadn't seen anything like that no. since 2008. <laughs> No, and actually the market volatility was more than we saw after the sort of the trust budget. Um, so, yeah, I don't think we were expecting that. And you're right, I think the Bank of England will hold back a little while and wait for the sort of markets to stabilise before it then goes back and thinks again about inflation. So I guess that's one of the things here around the sort of 3% inflation that probably did need a little bit of an increase in interest rates. So maybe that'll put a little bit of pressure on whether we achieve that by the end of the year. Indeed. But I think overall, I think businesses should be happy that actually there's light at the end of the tunnel. And I think things are now looking a lot brighter than they were you know, a few hours ago. And how do you think businesses are going to receive this budget from an economic point of view? Because let's mm. face it, a lot of these uh, measures that have been announced are going to take time to filter through. And yeah. we've still got to get through this year, haven't we? So looking back at quarter one, how, how have they been doing? No, it's really interesting. So last time we spoke, we saw this real disconnect between businesses who were really super optimistic and these sort of grim economic forecasts. And I think we were saying we don't understand how these forecasts are sort of looking so bad. And yet businesses are telling us they're sort of you know, going to do so well. And I think in our latest business outlook survey, actually, we saw real optimism still about, about the UK economy. So there was a slight drop from the December figure, but actually three quarters remained optimistic. And that's because they had confidence actually in a spring budget. So I think they've probably seen you know, that, that confidence has played out. Um, although during that, as I said, that, that last survey, they were less optimistic about business revenue growth. Although optimistic, three quarters optimistic about the economy, only two thirds were optimistic about their revenue growth. And that's because they were starting to see that decline in demand coming through. So optimistic about the economy, but actually the cost of loan crisis, the fall in demand was coming through. And I think it's sort of a similar message here, although we're hearing about, you know, in improved inflation in CPI and we're hearing about a sharper de downturn, so it's a shallower downturn. Actually, I think the devil's in the detail. So we're talking about CPI here, consumer price um, inflation falling to 3%. Actually, what we've seen as producer price inflation has remained higher. It hasn't fallen um, as sharply as CPI is falling. So actually, PPI is predicted to stay, stay higher for a while. And why is that? Um, it's the input costs that businesses are facing. So energy prices, wages. So energy prices, yes, they're falling. Wholesale prices are going down, but they, you know, they're still high. And wages, although we are um, seeing sort of decline in activity, actually the labour market remains really tight and the government's... Um, activities today aren't going to loosen that labour market immediately. So actually wages aren't falling in the way that, you, the way that you might expect. And I think what's interesting to me is that real household, again, buried in the OBR's detail, is that real household demand is going to fall by, or is forecast to fall by 5.7% over the next two years, and consumption will be down by almost 1% this year. So although we are seeing a shorter, shallower recession, actually that 1% decline in consumption will, will obviously you know, feed through into businesses. And those businesses that haven't allowed for those those factors in their business models mm -hmm. will need to do so, won't they? Because if demand is down, that's going to have yeah. an impact on them. And there's yeah. only so much they can do to pass on their costs. No, indeed. And again, the, you know, the track of before last, the businesses were saying, well, we're passing through, you know, we're passing through, I think it was 80% were saying we can pass through these cost increases in the form of higher prices. And we were sort of saying, well, how's that happening? We've got cost of living crisis. Who's, who's actually paying these prices? Um, but now, actually, in our latest survey, we're seeing something quite different. And I think businesses in equal measure are passing through. They are absorbing in the form of sort of lower profits um, and they're looking to cut costs. Um, and I think in terms of cutting costs, what we found before is that businesses were saying, if we are cutting costs, we're looking at our supply chain, we're trying to be more efficient. But actually, we're keeping investing in the key areas of ESG, in digital and people. 
And that sort of made sense. You know, we were hearing that lenders were giving better rates to those that had a great ESG business plan in place, and we were seeing a relatively tight labour market. So we needed we knew we needed to recruit and retain staff. Actually, in our lo- latest survey, we're seeing the opposite. So businesses are really pulling back on all those areas including staff and I think some of the government measures today around you know recruitment so around um, upskilling training etc will actually be of I think relief to businesses because they're no longer finding they're able to do this so actually the government is maybe coming into a gap that that sort of businesses are left at the moment yeah the returnerships which is not easy to I say know, I know, <laughs> the I know. new style of apprenticeships for I think for the other 50s or over 55 yeah, so some financial MOTs and yes, whatever else indeed we, sounds yeah. great doesn't yeah. it yeah anything else mm. you wanted to add at this stage no no I think that's great Brilliant, thank you. And Dave, how does this all impact Grant Thornton as a business? Well, Shelley had picked up a couple of the, the key themes. If you, if you step back and look at what we, everyone in, in, in business, has dealt with in the last two or three years, none of us could have expected it. I mean, we've got war in Europe, mm-hmm. goodness sake. It's, there's so much uncertainty out there. And if you want to sit on your hands, there's many reasons you can find to do that. What we increasingly try not to do is, is not to do that. Actually look at the, look at the longer-term decisions, because... Increasingly, in speaking to other uh, other CEOs, it's what what you talk about now defines the business. But perhaps more importantly, what you don't talk about now defines the business. What sort of business do you want to be when you're in better, less uncertain times? And what do our people expect of us? People join with an expectation of getting the best environment for them, delivering our client service. We have to carry on investing, and, and we carry on doing that. But for us, a very core focus on the investment in our people. But I think one of the key learning points for me in the last two or three years is agility. Yeah. It's very difficult to plan longer term. The, the Chancellor is starting to set out some longer term horizons. But given the uncertainty we've been through and what might be coming, having an agile business, business models for us is really important. Yes, so that inclusivity, so you, what, your values, the ethos that you've laid out, they still stand true? Because that's a longer t- about making the business longer term sustainable. We're a people business, attracting the very best people, having the most inclusive culture we can is, is a core element to that. So to say, actually, that doesn't work because there's a potential recession six months away, it's just a massive turn off to people. We've got to be true to our business and true to our purpose yeah. and maintain that long term discipline of this is the business we want to be. And at times, that's making some tough decisions and some investment decisions, which actually on a hard cold commercial basis you might not make because their longer term benefit isn't going to be seen sort of in a six 12 month horizon so it's that ability to look longer term maintain that core principles or, or the core purpose is really important for us and i suppose the last three years have shown you that it's hard to plan isn't it but a uh, plan was one of uh, jeremy hunt's key words today there's, there's always a difference between plan and planning isn't yeah. there? There's a, a plan is, is out of date by the yeah. time you put the, the full stop on the last yes. word but Having the, the, the core, yeah, what, are, what are we all about? Yeah, the best environment for our people, being certain what client service you want to do and being agile and flexing and yeah. is really important. That culture of change and readiness, yeah. that's so important, isn't it, is. it? That's really key, absolutely. And um, Shun, I've already talked about actually some of the impact that mm. the reality of the economic situation is having on businesses in general. But if we can maybe dive into a little bit more detail on that, we are seeing differences, aren't yeah. we, between yeah. sectors. So yeah. what are you seeing out there? Yeah, and I think you know, in our latest survey, three quarters of businesses told us they were optimistic about their funding position and they had been having those discussions with lenders that I think we've been encouraging them to have, um, which is you know really positive. And I think you know following this budget, I think they will feel even more confident. But you're right, we're seeing very different approaches depending on the sector in particular. So um, we've been working with a number of fib- fibre providers, for example, who are now looking at consolidation. Um, and there's 130 fibre providers in the UK, so hopefully one of those will get up to Robert in Glasgow soon. Um, but yeah, there's you know that's three per premise. You know you clearly can't have that many sort of fibre providers in the UK and what we found is a real difference of opinion between I think the seller price and the buyer price so we haven't found actually now as sort of economic conditions are getting tougher we're looking more at that consolidation and we're hearing a number of deals happening um, and similarly there's some great news stories around sort of businesses working with local authorities where some of those levelling up funds are coming through and local authorities are, are, are looking at sort of ha- how to spend those and, and meet those plans we're again seeing businesses in the local areas really trying to understand how they can maximise that so we've been working with a couple of local banks who are looking to set up um, on the high street and provide those sort of services to, to local people and local businesses. And again, that's in some of those areas where the investment zones have been, been announced. That'll be interesting for them. And again, similarly, sort of housing providers, real estate firms, working with local authorities on those regeneration plans. So I think for, for some of these businesses, they've been really looking at sort of what, what's been available to them and, yeah, switching into those markets where there is still 
wasteful expenditure. And sort of making mm. sure those businesses know what's out there as well. So yeah. many people still don't know about those um, grants that are available no, to local authorities. No, indeed. And I think, um, and you know, we might touch on this later, but I think particularly around the investment zones, but also around levelling up, what we've seen is there were some great plans in, you know, approved. Local authorities have put in some plans, government selected a few, and there's now a lot of cash going out there. And I'm sure we'll say with, here with the investment zones, there'll be some great plans, we'll have, you know, some, some great aspirations. The problem is the businesses don't actually understand what's available and local authorities are actually quite confused. So we're seeing them trying to do these deals, but they're not really sure what they can and can't spend on, as you say, some of the sort of tax advantages, etc. And also we have the new subsidy control rules in place. So as businesses are trying to, you know, get involved with the local authorities, the local authorities are really concerned about subsidy control rules in a way that the state aid rules when we were in the EU wouldn't have applied to them. So I think we need maybe a little bit more clarity on sort of some of these rules and regulations and just for businesses to really understand the, you know, the level of funding that's available and that they can access. And Karen, I know you've got a, a dual role. So what are you seeing and hearing from your clients? Sorry, do you mean just generally from a business perspective? Yes. Yeah, I think people are relatively positive. Um, the main message I hear consistently from clients is around talent and has been talent still, particularly in some of the sectors. I know I mentioned childcare earlier, but um, that sort of battle for talent and, and sort of getting people in is still another message that we hear consistently from people. Um, and I guess some of the interesting stuff around things like the subsidies, some of the stuff that uh, um, Shelley was talking about there as well, that then interacts into things like, you know, your R&D and it the other tax reliefs and everything those, as well. They all come back yeah. together, yeah, don't they? Those come lines, don't we? Yeah, the tram lines of where happy. those are, yeah. 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 And Robert, uh, we've fixed the fibre, so uh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's consolidated. How about great. me? What are, you Thank you. what are you seeing and hearing from your point of view, from your clients? Well, I would echo the point earlier just about to the extent that it's very sector specific. So we've got a classic situation where some sectors are bemused by the conversation that says there's an economic tightening because there's just more demand that they can possibly deal with. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you've got some sectors that are obviously very badly affected by it all and thinking about, well, how do we how do we access uh, uh, finance in particular? And I think that's a piece that's still to come through in terms of the economic um, uh, impact on all of this is the, the nature and the access to finance is going to be very different. We're going to have uh, higher interest rates. So where we've used debt previously, that's going to potentially change the structure. We've got uh, higher interest rates at the moment has different impact on access to private equity, venture capital funding. So even when you look at the SVB bank, ultimately that was a mismatch of long-term funding and short-term commitments. So all clients going back and looking at their financial structure and ensuring that there is a match up between the long term nature of finance and the long term investment plans and similarly with the short term, I think is really critical. And I'm hearing that a lot from clients just taking that time to pause and think, how are we financially structured on a sustainable basis, given there's a change in the economic circumstances and particularly higher interest rates? Thank you, Robert. And Shillian, who do you think the winners and losers, if we can put them into those two categories, will be as the economy continues to recover? Yeah, I think it's sort of Robert and Karen have said it very much depends on the sector, but also on the strategies, I think, undertaken by, by management at the moment. Um, so a third of businesses have told us they're looking at international opportunities, um, and that sort of makes sense. Other economies are doing better than us. So I think it, it makes sense to sort of look abroad as much as Jeremy Hunt wants to encourage um, business in. Um, obviously, you know, those that look to make use of the expenditure that's been announced today. So, you know, we've had a £11 billion um, pound injection into the Defence Fund, so increasing to sort of 2.5% of GDP in the longer term. That will obviously support sectors of the economy. Again, you know, the high growth investment zones, great opportunities there, particularly if you can sort of marry up with some of the levelling up funds that are available. And as I said, sort of those investment zones are those in the sort of the core levelling up areas, which I think is quite interesting. Um, life science is obviously great. There's um, a change to the medical regulations. We know we've always been a great, you know, great, great country for, for life sciences. And if you look at sort of the COVID, the pharma, the university um, collaboration that we had, the budget today will support that. So I think, you know, healthcare, life sciences, businesses will continue to do really well. Um, digital technologies, obviously, I'm not going to try and explain quantum <laughs> computing. <laughs> we we, we realised earlier today that, that I'm capable of, um, of going there. But I think, you know, again, we're looking at those digital technologies and it's all around that sort of high intensity R&D. Um, I know we talked about this before, but health and social care providers, you know, the government policy, healthcare policy, we're seeing more and more money being ploughed into the NHS, but it's around virtual wards, it's around being provided 
providing those hospital services at home. It's about keeping people out of hospital. Um, and how and, about retailers yeah. as well? Because Retail, obviously, yeah, yeah the, when you think about the changing consumer yeah. preferences, yeah. it's the retail industry where margins are really tight as it is. I mean, do you see winners within this area? No, definitely. We've actually started um, in our economic consulting team working with some of our audit clients, actually looking at some of their forecasts. So it's probably quite, quite a timely discussion. But you're right. I think there are some retailers that are maybe focused on ESG, sustainability, etc., and are really trying to sort of differentiate themselves in the marketplace. So away from um, fast fashion. Again, yes, exactly. Um, and they, you know, they, they seem to be doing well. Um, and obviously the renewable sector as well. You know, we, we, we continue to support the renewable sector, so... So, Dave, how does this all compare what you've heard from your colleagues to Grant Thornton's own outlook? So we're, I guess, cautiously optimistic is, is, is maybe the way you put it. And, and let's go back. I said uh, earlier comments on the budget feels better than it did in October. And let's not forget, on Monday I woke up and I was 7 o'clock, HSBC had stepped in on, on SVB. You think that's a much better position it could have been. And then a Chancellor stands up to say we're not in recession. So it does feed to overall confidence. But I think for us... Having a strong plan, communicating it constantly and investing mm. against that plan has been core cool to us. So, so what does that mean in reality? For, we are a sort of multidisciplinary business, but being really intentional in the markets we are and what we're trying to do is where it starts for us. So we operate in the mid-market, large corporate and public sector at largely and saying, right, in this market, this is our audit approach, our tax approach and our advisory approach. Making sure that is clear to everyone in the business and then taking time out to con constantly communicate that in every sort of interaction we have with our partners and our people and our clients so they know what we're trying to do. But the key then is investing behind it. So if you want to be the leading firm in the mid-market right now, you've got to be helping them with digital transformation, you've got to be helping them with their uh, ESG transformation, and we've got to invest in that. So it's been bold in the plan, communicating it to our people and continuing to invest is what's kept us in, in relatively good measure, frankly, since mid-2020, when that initial shockwave from COVID had gone. It's, it's going back to those, those first principles. And at the core of that, to repeat in a little bit my early answer, but no apologies, is having that purpose around what our people are trying to achieve, how we go about it, and what we're trying to offer our clients and our broader communities. Are you finding it, though, hard to access talent? And if so, what is the impact? I, I, it's always been the, the, the single biggest limiter to our growth is not just accessing it, it's attracting it and retaining it. Has it held us back? Probably no, but uh, if we had more, we could do more if that's not a complete paradox. So, so at the core of what we're trying to do is the very best people proposition we can. So it was music to my ears when the Chancellor was standing up, as they say, accessing different bits of community perhaps aren't able to work for whatever reasons they find themselves in, whether it's better provision of care or accessing uh, people over 50. But for us, the, the core of what we're trying to do is the best environment, the best people proposition. And the way I articulate that is, the, what is that environment? It's the physical environment. Yeah, okay, we've got to have a nice, nice buildings to work in, so it feels nice thing to work. Digital environment's increasingly important to make you feel the tech, tech enabled. But more over and above that, their well-being and their emotional environment's really important. So having things like market leading family leave for, which recognises the society we are today, not that we used to be 10, 20 years ago. And increasingly for us, being as flexible as we can to access as different parts of the potential workforce is really core cool to what we're trying to do. It's, we can't say you're nine to five anymore. That's long since gone. We've proved that. That model's history. And if we can get that right for more people, then that will really help us unlock access to different talent. Now, earlier on when we were um, watching the budget, I noticed you were drawing out a little diagram and about the importance of the physical, the built environment, yeah. the digital and the emotional environment. And so obviously, you know, you sort of live and breathe that. But what does that actually mean to you? Well, I get that. Focus on the emotion of it. What does that mean? It's sort of perhaps try, but everyone's got to be themselves when they come to work. But not... But having a culture where people feel included such that... A, it's welcoming and it attracts them in the first place. But for us, given what we do, the ability to challenge clients, the ability to speak up, the ability to have access clients for support gives us access to a lot more people. And what underpins that is some of our DNI policies, some of our uh, stuff we do around wellbeing, the stuff we do about some of the social mobility indexes, which we get uh, year on year, we get really, really good feedback on. It's creating that just broader 
infrastructure for people, which attracts people, frankly, who weren't looking at an organisation like ours 10, 15 years ago. And how does that impact then, say, the clients watching? What, why should they care about that? I, I should care about because we're trying increasingly to have a workforce which reflects our societies and our clients. And so if we're attracting the very best people, they're going to get the very best people working for them. They're going to do even better client service. And every client you speak to wants to have people working with them who broadly reflect society the same that they're trying to do. It's, if you go back to the archetypal, you're yeah, turning up in your suits to work for a tech company, you think you're not in tune with your clients at all in how they're trying to interact and how they're trying to be. And any further plans for 2023 that you can share or not? The thing we'll continue to look at is that the deal we have with our people and our potential people, particularly around different leave aspects, and an idea I've got in my head of people who sort of slap me for saying it out loud is something like grandparent leave. And what is that? Well, that accesses that over 50s market, which Chancha was talking about. Why not? People in different age stages of their career want to have time off to work with different bits of their family. Let's look at it. And the more we can do that to build, to build a, a really, really good proposition for so many different people, we'll just continue to do it. So a very flexible approach. As flexible as we can possibly be. That sounds good. Um, and Shelley, is there anything that the government can do to support businesses further? Yeah, I think in our survey, as Karen mentioned, businesses said they wanted to hear more about devolved powers levelling up um, around economic inactivity, so getting more people back into the workforce and softening that labour market and supporting digital transformation. Um, and maybe Jeremy Hunt you know, read, our, read our survey because he certainly tackled all three. But I think, as we were saying, the devil's in the detail, and I think potentially the government maybe could have gone further. So, you know, they focused on keeping the market settled, which is great. Um, they focused on sort of giving that confidence. They rolled back a little bit on some of the regulation we heard around sort of healthcare life sciences, some of the tax policies. But, you know, we were with a big retail bank um, the week before last, and they they were saying we've got all this ESG funding we're desperate to give out, particularly to the mid-market. We can't get anyone to find the time to actually put a business plan together and bring us this business plan to get the ESG funding out there. So I think it's around sort of freeing up businesses to really access some of these opportunities and to sort of, you know, access the funds available and to sort of stimulate the economy. I think inactivity, again, the government, you know, did a great job. They announced some great plans. Um, if you look at what the Institute of Fiscal Studies is saying, it's not actually going to have a very big impact. I think the pension reforms and the, um, the childcare, you know, they're, they're saying it'll be the low tens of thousands that come back in. And that's partly because I think the childcare that people need is different these days. We're a sort of 24-7 economy. People want to work flexibly and they need that childcare to be flexible. And I think some of the disappointment was around that the government had encouraged sort of employers and employees to work together to find that solution that works for the employees and maybe encouraging businesses to do that. So some of the initiatives that Dave's talking about, you think we planned this, but, um, you know, that, that hadn't come through from the government and maybe that would have been a, you know... A, a, another way to encourage those sort of parent, parents back in. And again, the better communication with businesses around support and active opportunities. I said that earlier, there's been a lot of announcements and there is around levelling up and there's lots of grants available. And, but I think businesses are complicated and businesses don't know what's out there. And we work a lot with local authorities and the local authorities are telling us that they really don't know how to get the money out there. And again, the subsidy control rules are really complicated and local authorities don't want to take the risk of, is it a subsidy, is it a not? Are we going to get a challenge? What's the CMA going to say? So I think they need to sort of the government needs to give really clear guidance on who can access this funds, what it can be done, you know, and how local authorities can really make the most of this. And what impact does that have on, say, for example, Northern Ireland as well, when they talk about the subsidy control rules? Mm. That impacts them, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think, um, obviously, Northern Ireland's got a lot simpler, um, you know, in, in recent weeks with the New Deal, and I think that's great. Everybody encourages that. And um, I think where we're seeing more, though, as I said, is before I used to you know, work a lot on state aid, and it would be with big, you know, it'd be with the UK GI, it'd be with Treasury, the Welsh Government, it would be major companies. Now, actually, most of our requests are coming from local authorities who are just saying, you know, we weren't caught by this before, and we've got all these new funds available, we've got all these new devolved powers, levelling up powers, but we just can't, we can't use them, so... I think that would be my plea to government is to look at those rules and maybe, you know, how we can communicate them more clearly and give, give businesses and local authorities more certainty. Yeah, and Karen, did you want to add anything from a tax perspective to that? Yeah, obviously we've had announcements today. Could have gone further, couldn't it? Mm -hmm. I think what will be interesting is whilst Jeremy Hunt was sort of saying 25% rate was sort of still a relatively low rate, it's a big jump from 19% yeah. that we had um, historically. And I guess... I thought we might have heard a bit more of a roadmap today through mm -hmm. to how we will get to lower taxes because some of the different sort of press coverage he was doing when he was on Laura Coonsberg's uh, on Sunday, mm -hmm. etc. He was talking about that sort of, um, you know, 
lower taxes, not yet, but but that's what will generate growth. I so, think Laura reminded him, didn't he, some yeah. of his past statements where he promised yeah, to be a exactly. low tax. Yeah, yeah. And that so, does impact uh, <laughs> where businesses want to be HQs, to be domiciled, yes, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And we've seen some, um, you know, some companies make statements of saying yeah. they're going to Ireland, going yeah. to other places because of the, mm. the sort of tax rate. So I think um, whilst... I, I sort of understand why he would why he stayed with a twenty five percent rate for now. I think given more of a roadmap might have been good today mm. and people having that sort of view of where it might be going. And I guess the other area I think a bit more around that R and D. I mean he talks yeah. about there's all these sort of references to the UK being, you know, the new Silicon Valley and the investment and he talked a lot in his budget speech, didn't he, about technical and yep. quantum <laughs> computing and whatever it might be, all those sort of things. But actually um, for those um, smaller businesses, the SMEs, which are sort of seeing that real hit to their R&D, although there was that announcement today that I mentioned earlier, it's quite restrictive in terms of how it applies and therefore um, there's, a, there's a missed opportunity there. I think if we're really serious about innovation in the UK and really developing that, having something that fills that gap a bit more, I think would still be great to see. Dave? Yeah, just following what Karen said, uh, Chancellor talked a lot about the UK as a place to do business and lots of positivities, but th there is a big paradox that our corporation tax rate is significantly higher than that it is, say, in Dublin. Yeah. So we really have to look at that. If, if where businesses are making that choice, where they want to be based. I Although think I think important. the interesting bit with that is that when you see the Pillar 2 stuff, that global minimum tax mm -hmm. is sort of starting to... Started to Starting to do that, but, you know, it's still, that's 15%, so there's still, yes. yeah, it's, it's interesting to see how that, um, that might work through. And um, Robert, if I can bring you back in again, specifically on energy support, is there more the government can be doing very briefly? Yeah, well, first and foremost, I think the government needs to give a clear strategy as to what is the energy strategy for the country. You know, what are the key sources that we need to be focusing on over the next 30 years? But um, beyond that, directly for corporates, I think most of them know that the current energy relief bill ends on the 31st of March. Um, uh, and, and in the absence of that, the two things that businesses really need to do is think about their efficiency um, and also what impact it might have on their pricing. Um, so a lot of companies, uh, I think in our tracker survey, uh, indicated that I think 35% of them said, we're going to have to find efficiencies, therefore be innovative about how we use energy, really understand how energy is driven, also understand where the government will provide support, so fuel switching and heat networks. Um, today there was another announcement around carbon capture. So there's support there, but innovation is going to be the key to unlocking that and also looking at how can we ensure going forward that we're, we're, we're clear about how we're using our energy and therefore how we can improve on it. And let's focus now on ESG, Robert, and staying with you, and uh, going back to the recent Grant Thornton Business Outlook Tracker, which we've quoted quite a lot today already, that interestingly showed a decline in the focus on ESG at 32%, so down 5% from 37% in December. And that's slightly surprising on the one hand, given the increasing ESG reporting requirements and obviously the established link between able to access funding and the price of that funding and then having a good quality ESG plan in place. So why do you think we're seeing those figures? Well, I think firstly, I would differentiate between larger corporates and mid-market corporates in that statistic as well, because I'll come back to it, but large corporates pretty much have very little um, room for manoeuvre. They have to report. They already have commitments to regulators uh, and shareholders about where their ESG strategy goes. But I think our survey was very much focused on the mid-market. And it's because I think a lot of mid-market businesses without that regulatory requirement still see as ESG as an optional spend. And therefore, because it is discretionary in their minds, then what happens is as soon as you get a tightening of cash, which happens when obviously when interest rates are going up and there's an inflationary pressures in their business and they're trying to maintain margin, then spend on ESG looks like something that's a luxury. However, we know that that's really not going to be the case and that the danger of that is it's quite a short-term view because quite clearly in the long term, um, ESG isn't just about a bit of short-term spend a bit of money on saving some carbon. It actually goes to the core of how a business works. Now, Dave's touched several times on what is the purpose of the business? How are you making decisions on a long-term sustainable basis that links to your purpose? 
And therefore, ESG goes to the heart of cost reduction and profitability, how you're optimising supply chains. As I said earlier, reviewing energy strategies to keep your costs down. It goes to the core of talent, attraction and retention, um, investment skills for the future, investment in well-being to ensure your employees remain engaged is an, a, a vital part of ESG. You then, how do you retract customers? Well, customers are only going to want to come to you if you have got a strong reputation in the marketplace um, through both being competitive, but also by the credentials you have around how you approach dealing with people and dealing with the environment and the overall governance in which you run your business. Um, attracting finance, I touched on a second ago. I mean, lenders are now under pressure to make sure they're reporting on their, what we call scope three emissions. So they need to be lending to businesses that have a well-developed ESG strategy, and most of them are offering some discount to your interest costs if you have got a well-balanced ESG strategy. So that, again, is another area you need to focus on for the longer term as well as in the, in the short term. And it, we, we know that taking all those stakeholders into account, that short-term cuts in ESG spend are likely to have a fairly quick impact on the talent you can get, the customers you work with, the suppliers you work with, and access to finance. So it's not a surprise that it's reduced, but I am concerned that some of the medium and longer term impact of, of that happening. And of course, those supply chain pressures, if you're part of a large corporate supply chain, Robert, then you're going to be pushing your agendas down, if you're not doing that already, at some point to the mid-market. So that's why I suppose the focus still has to be on ESG and will continue to do so in the coming months and years. Well, absolutely. I mean, as I say, large corporates have got so many reporting requirements that they need to meet. So they are in particularly under pressure. So they push that pressure down to anybody in their supply chain. So it's another reason why even if you're sitting in the mid-market uh, thinking this is discretionary spend, you're going to get hit quite early on with a message that one of your big customers or one of your big uh, suppliers who are a large corporate insists that you're able to demonstrate improvement in your ESG data. Um, and one small point on that is also mid-market businesses need to spend on their systems to be able to capture the right data. And don't underestimate how difficult that is because a number of large corporates are struggling with that as well. So it's a big part of your ESG planning. Thank you, Robert. And Dave, I mean, the bottom line is that ESG is not going away, is it? Not for Grant Thornton and not for those businesses that you work with. Well, absolutely not. And it, 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 Robert, for the reasons Robert said, it's absolutely critical to what you do. Our people expect it, our clients expect it. Frankly, if you're going to be a purposeful business, it's the right thing to do. But I, the, the other thing you to bring into the room is it's actually quite, really quite difficult, made more difficult when we've got quite an expansionist international strategy. You, you're not it's not that easy to make new relationships. We're forced to in 2020, but it's not 2020 now. So there is that element of the world unwinding, unlocking and moving around again. But the core for us, and maybe say, yes, Dave, you're a firm of accountants, of course you've got good data. We have better data than we've ever had, is making targets based on science, on, 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 the, science, on the data that we've got in our business and dispelling some myths. So everyone focuses on the E of ESG. Right, this year, 5% of our... Uh, emissions of due to flights in 2019 before the before lockdowns a little bit more so it's not the, the thing that's driving us so we we've taken that out to our people and we had about a thousand of our six thousand people join different workshops because what we're not going to do is impose stuff on our people when it's 20 or 25 people are doing the flying to create the five percent it's how do you want to be a business to make this really sustainable and the thing that made me really proud is the desire of people to, yes, look after the environment, but really to move to the S of ESG and to take their skills outside this business to the broader communities, to broaden opportunities for people. And you think that's the thing that really motivates you, that we're doing the right thing longer term of our purpose. That ESG isn't just about the E, we've got to get that right, of course we have, but we have a desire of our people to do so much more. And you think, oh, just makes you so proud and that will attract even more people. So you're right, it's not going away, but thankfully it's, we don't want it to go away because we're actually embracing it in the best way we can. Well, it's it's good for business on so many levels. And actually, from an investor point of view, when you've seen a lot of um, active investors making a stand, um, wanting to see ESG a, a core to business strategy, and many chief execs losing their positions if they can't communicate... Thanks for that. ...you yeah. know, an ESG strategy <laughs> to the market sufficiently. And, and, and our clients tell us, they've told us about... Our, 
uh, DNI in the past, and they say about ESG, we do a lot of ESG assurance and ESG transformation. Don't come and talk to us unless you've sorted your own house out and you've got a clear strategy. And what we don't do as a leadership team is impose stuff like that on, on our people. It's we build it from within because it's more sustainable. But absolutely right. We can't go and say we can help you transform your ESG. Oh, by the way, our carbon footprint's destroying the world. That's not sustainable, is it? So. Uh, thank you, Dave. And Robert, um, back to you. What do you think practically firms should be doing now if they're not doing it already? Well, I think there's three stages on your ESG strategy. It's identifying what uh, issues you have, developing a plan and, and embedding that and then implementing it effectively. But so just touching the identification point, I mean, again, try and breaking down the E, S and the G, um, making sure you're really clear about what is uh, the priorities for your business, what are the priorities for your stakeholders, your employees, your suppliers, your customers. And we call that materiality assessment, and, but that's something that's being done particularly in the relation to the environment. But I, I would apply the exact same principle to the the S and also the G. So being really clear about what are the what are the issues, what are the really important priorities for our business and all the stakeholders, and how do we set a level of ambition for ourselves to make sure that we are really never going to get caught out with this. We're not going to have customers, suppliers, lenders coming back and saying, well, you're way behind uh, the, the rest of the pack. You do have to make a decision, are you going to be a leader? Are you going to be a follower in your market? And how confident are you that you can achieve that? But first of all, identify the issues and set the goals and make sure you're doing that in conjunction with your stakeholders. The second phase of really developing out the ideas is making sure that ESG isn't then done on the side of the desk or something that you can uh, stick over the top of everything else that you're doing without really embedding it into the strategy. So what are your key strategic objectives? What culture do you want to have as an organisation? What's your action plan? And then look at every one of them in the context of, okay, what's the ESG impact? And how do we need to amend those strategic aims and actions and culture to make sure we achieve our ambitions? And then finally, the implementation. So making sure, as I say, we're really clear on who's responsible for it, who's driving it forward. And again, that those actions are embedded into the day-to-day -day work of everybody in the organisation. So I think it's really important, particularly for mid-market businesses where this is new, identify the issues, do that with your stakeholders, develop a plan and embed it into the strategic plan you have for a business and then go and implement and make sure everybody's going along with you. Wise words, Robert. And something you've said to me in the past is um, something along the lines of horizon scanning, which I thought uh, beautifully summed up what people should be doing in this space as well. So what did you mean by that? Sorry, Nadine, you just broke up as you said what you were uh, questioning. Hor yeah, horizon scanning. It's something you've mentioned right. to me before. And I thought that was a, a perfectly positioned statement for businesses to think about. So what did you mean by that? Well, I think horizon scanning is a powerful tool for all businesses looking at what's coming down the track from a regulatory point of view, from a customer preference point of view, from how uh, your employees are going to change their attitudes. A lot of this we've touched on today. So really trying to get, uh, uh, again, stakeholders together. Don't do this just as an internal um, process within your business. Get your stakeholders and start looking five, 10 years ahead and say, well, what changes can we see happening in our marketplace for talent, for customers, for lenders, and therefore to address those needs and to address what they're going to be looking for how do we then start mapping out our steps and our action plans to reach those those ambitions? And I think horizon scanning becomes powerful because it makes you think about that slightly longer term position. And back to the thing I touched on earlier, actually, funnily enough, with SBB Bank, it's all about making sure you're matching up your long term plans with how you fund and structure and organise your business. Because if any of that becomes out of alignment, you'll end up at some point with a short term problem. Great. Thank you, Robert. We've had a few questions in from Slido. So thank you very much for submitting those. And actually staying with Robert, now that you're on a roll, um, which markets are showing the most opportunity for UK businesses post-Brexit? Hopefully you heard that, Robert. I did, thank you, Nidhi. Um, 
Well, I think, interestingly and not surprisingly, when you look at where the fastest growing economies are in the world and economic regions, that's where a lot of UK businesses are very attracted to. And indeed, the, the companies in those countries are actually attracted to the UK as well. So the areas that we see most growth are in India, probably number one. I think it's probably the fastest growing um, uh, economy in the world at, at present at, in terms of the, the, the rate of growth. And then what we call the Asian regions, so Southeast Asia, particularly around uh, Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Thailand and Malaysia. We're seeing huge growth there. And again, huge demand for uh, British business and British industry. Innovation, particularly around some of the, the sectors like financial services, pharmaceutical, technology, where the UK have got really strong reputation. We're seeing great growth there. Obviously, there's been some trade deals that have driven some additional um, activity in places like Australia and New Zealand. Um, but, but finally, obviously, you still have a huge demand in the USA and Canada for UK businesses looking to expand, and we continue to support and encourage our clients to do so. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions around uh, the taper. Is there anything in the budget about the taper rules in relation to pensions? Seems crazy to increase the allowances but not impact the taper. And then another question, does the taper still apply for higher rate taxpayers? So it's got tax, the clues in the question. Karen, it's, it's over to you. <laughs> so I think, I, I think I talked about this, but obviously yes. didn't explain it very well. So basically the, the 40 has gone to 60,000, yeah? Um, so that means that your average person could contribute up to 60,000 into a pension scheme, assuming they had that. And obviously there's ability to access earlier years as well, which might be a supplementary question we'll come back to in a minute. But what the current rules, i.e. before the budget changes said, is that if you earned more than 240,000, that 40,000 limit was tapered at a pound for every two pound of earnings. So effectively you were then capped out. So once you got to, I can't remember the number, it was 300 and something, 112,000, I think it was, that meant that you could only contribute 4,000 pounds, which is obviously a significantly lower amount than 40. What is happening under the new rules is that 240,000 has increased to 260,000 now. Um, and basically what that means if you work it through the, the cap, the bottom end cap, will be that the minimum amount you can contribute, which was 4,000, will now be 10,000 um, pounds. So that means effectively, if you work that back through, that it will taper away between earnings of 260,000 and 360,000. And when you get to 360,000, you're at the 10,000 um, um, minimum amount. Beautifully explained, I think. So uh, I'm going to stay with you now <laughs> for that one. Um, can the new 60,000 pension allowance be backdated or applied in previous tax years? Right. Well, I've asked someone else that question because I didn't know the answer <laughs> to that. And luckily, someone's just come back to me and said, we don't think so. So I'm not, I'm not committing either way, but we, uh, we're just... We'll double check on that and we'll maybe sort of um, put that... We'll put that in the follow-up that we send out. Um, it doesn't specifically say but the new uh, rule is coming in from 1st of April 2023, so I would be very surprised if it was backdated in any way, so I think the existing rules will probably apply up to that point. And a question um, we've got, I'd be grateful you could please elaborate a little bit more on the pension auto-enrolment for higher payers that has a hard timeline of April. Yep. OK, again, this is not my specialist subject on a mastermind type of uh, way, so I've phoned a friend. Um, so basically... What that's about is that there are lots of people... So to opt out of auto-enrolment, you had to have a good reason to do so. Um, and people who had previously, for example, reached the lifetime allowance could have chosen to opt out. Um, or, for example, someone um, who was in... who'd taken the transitional protection, so you could take a transitional cap, for example, couldn't make further pension contributions if you do that without then having adverse tax implications. So there were good reasons for um, some people to opt out. Those reasons are kind of gone now because the cap's gone so therefore you haven't got that same ability or reason for people to opt out so therefore you need to be looking at do those people need to um, be are they now within the auto enrollment look at that population so those higher earners the people who were previously opted out that had good reasons for being do you need to look at them and, and because the change comes in on 1st of April there's quite a short time window to have a look at that and make so sure. if you've opted out you can go back in again 
Well, I think the the reason for this is you may be you may be uh, you've, your reason for opting out might be gone now. Yeah, okay. At the point. So, so if that op that reason for opting out is gone, then therefore that's why you need to look at your auto enrolment and make sure you're doing it properly. And I and I I will get one of our experts in this area who knows what they're doing on this inside out because it's not my specialist subject, as I say. And we'll put that in the follow up as well. Yeah. Just make sure that we explain that. Oh, I can see an insights people. article coming down the track as well. <laughs> it's, all, it's all coming together. Yeah. We'll just very quickly, I'm just going to bring Robert for the last one. A um, bit of a general question, but are businesses still looking to access overseas markets? So if you can do that in under 30 seconds, um, I'll be very grateful. Well, yeah, massively. I mean, I think the opportunities are, are huge and particularly thinking about that in terms of how are you going to sell into those markets? So are you going to do it through distributors? Are you going to do it through agents, direct selling, having operations online, on, on site in different countries? Um, but it's a massively attractive proposition, particularly when you're in a UK economy that isn't going to be growing dramatically over the next few years. So accessing some of the markets I mentioned earlier, uh, India, Southeast Asia, there's huge growth opportunities. So we, we continue to see uh, UK clients at, look at those markets and look at well, what's the opportunity for them to further expand. And also just finally encourage people to think about their supply chains as well, because there is a a piece about how you remain sustainable and having supply chains in different parts of the world has proven several times to give you a much more robust business. So, yep, I'd say lots of opportunity across the waters. Oh, not quite 30 seconds, but around 40. We'll allow that. Thank you, Robert. So as we <laughs> head towards uh, the end of this broadcast, let's get one final thought from each of our panellists. And in particular, looking ahead to the rest of 2023 and 2024, what's your one key message and thought that you'd like to share with the audience? So if I can start with you, Robert... Well, it probably fitting with what I've just said, be bold, go and look for opportunities outside the UK, build up a good picture of what you can achieve and go and ask for support to go and access those markets. Same to you, Shellian. Look at the opportunities in the UK, so levelling up the investment funds, you know, R&D, etc. Lots of opportunities here too. Karen? For me, it's probably what I always say, which is plan and prepare. Make sure that you understand what's available. What we've seen today, what we always see, um, so one of the other things that was in the tracker that people asked for that they didn't get was tax simplification. Mm. Um, so tax is really complex, really complicated. The rules, it's never what it looks like at first glance. So make sure you really understand what's coming down the pipe at you. What sort of, And that could be from a, making sure that you comply with regulations point of view, like the auto enrolment we were just talking about there, but also um, making sure that you're benefiting, you're accessing all the reliefs that are available and you're not missing out on something that could be, you know, have a real big positive cash um, impact on your business. And while it remains complicated, you'll never be able to retire, Karen, so there you go. <laughs> well, I'm experienced, aren't I? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and Dave? Uh, two things. One, I repeat my comment earlier. I'm so glad I'm sat next to Karen on this panel when the tax questions came in. But you watched that budget earlier and I sat next to you commenting on it and you think we are immeasurably better than we were some months ago and we went to a bad place. And when you interact, particularly with colleagues internationally, there's a bit of Brit bashing going on. You think there's, there's plenty of detail we need to, to really finesse what, what, what the Chancellor said today. But there's also an awful lot in it, and there's an awful lot for employers like us to get behind access to the, the, the packages around care and, 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 and getting more people into the workforce. So get that positivity and really support Britain as a place to do business. Let's work with what's there and get the detail and make the absolute best of it we can. Oh, I'm feeling that positivity. So to put it in a <laughs> bottle and sell it, I think. Well, thank you so much to Karen, Shelley and Dave and Robert. So please do get in contact with any of the panellists and their details should be on your screen now. Alternatively, if you have a regular contact within Grant Thornton, please feel free to reach out to them as well. There's somebody within the firm who can help you, uh, whatever your query is. Now, a recording of this webinar is going to be available uh, following this event and you'll be notified when that's available. So... That brings a conclusion to our broadcast. I'd like to thank um, you all for watching on behalf of Grant Thornton. Thank you so much for your questions and comments throughout the broadcast and for taking part on, in this programme. So thank you very much again. I wish you all the very best and see you again soon. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>